Good evening. Last week when we finished Hanukkah, there was one short item that I thought was important that I wanted to share with you. And I'm going to begin. It's Parshas Vayigash. Uh, and last week, like I said to you, only once in 24 years does Makates find itself outside of Hanukkah. But there is a famous question why there is no Isru Chag to Hanukkah. And for those of you who would answer me, well, it's only Diorises like Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot that we have in Isru Chag. It's not so, because we see by Purim, which is also Durabanan, just like Hanukkah is, that there is uh, Shushan Purim, and then the Gemara even says that the 16th day and the 17th day, many people do not say Tachnun. La many people do say Tachnun, but the fact that there is a sprinkling of the Tam of Purim that the Gemara says under certain circumstances that the extension of the power of Purim can go even to the 16th or 17th day to be Mekayim Mitzvahs of Purim. So we see it's a shach, it's a shaykhis to Purim itself. So why no Isru Chag then something? a day after Hanukkah? And the answer is the theme of what I was telling you all along, that Hanukkah is the send-off for 2,000 years of Golos, and Isru, many taich, means Isru to tie together all the koiches that are presented by that yomtiv, like uh, Shavuos goes into the Yemei Hamiluim, that if a person didn't bring the necessary korbanos, Shalmei uh, Chagiga, Shalmei Simcha, that it has another week that he can go in and still do it uh, and attach itself to the Simcha or the idea of the Yom Tiv. Um, we don't want to confine Hanukkah and tie it up like with Isru Chag and its koiches, even though Yom Tev is mashpia, like we say, Vasienu Hashem Elokeinu is Birkas Mo that there is a very special bracha from each Yom Tev, which every person we say it in Shemon Esrei three times every day of Yom Tiv, that we want to carry it with us. <laughs> but we want to also have the power of the Yom Tiv contained to be able to be Mashbia. But on Hanukkah, we don't want any containment. We want the full force and full-fledged strength of Yom Tev to be sprinkled throughout the 2,000-year Golos without any containment in Hanukkah itself. Now, Rav Elia Lapian Zecher Tzadik Levrocha once discussed in a drosha that it was the end of Parshas Miketz, and we see that the whole story with the brothers, with the Gevia, with the Becher, and with the money, and with everything that was going on, there was a very subjective, a very simple hachno to the atmosphere with the brothers and Yosef. And they were trying to explain who they were and what will it'll do to their father, to his life, to his health. 
and they were very much machnia themselves in these explanations and in the communication and the discussion between Yosef HaTzadik, who they didn't know was Yosef, And then we come to an eruption uh, in Vayigash from the last sedra, from the last pusik of Mekates that he said that we will remain avodim to you and, and and uh, and uh, you have caught us with the goods in our hands, so we have no response. And the very next pasuk, Vayigash El of Yehuda, the Medrash says that Yehuda stepped forth, and he said to Yosef, he first the Medrash says took a bar of steel, and with his teeth. He bit it in half to show that we are not just tzaddikim or rabbis or however we look to you. We have the power to be able to take you on. Now, last said that they didn't speak like that. The Medrash says that Yehuda turned to Naphtali and said, go scout the land and come back and tell me how many separate communities or counties there are in Egypt. And he came back and told him there were 12. So Yehuda the Medrash says, told him, I will take on three of the communities and wipe them out. And each brother, the remaining nine, will each go to the other each one to one community and wipe them out. And he said to Yosef at that point, Ki chamocha kefaro, look at the Medrash. The Medrash says that just like I'll kill you, I'll kill Pharaoh. That power will be killed. So ask Rebel Yelapian, from being soft-spoken and easygoing and trying to explain, to a very strengthened, warlike fashion in how he was dealing with Yosef. So he explained, as the Medrash discusses, that the brothers thought the whole time that they were having such trouble here. They just came for some food. And now there was such confrontation that the reason they were suffering and having this sorrows that Shimon was put into jail in front of their eyes and everything that happened, that it happened because of the Mechira of Yosef. That they were being punished that they were living through tragedy because what they did to their brother. But now at the tail end of Mekates, when Yosef says, no, you brothers did nothing. I found the Gevi'ah by Binyamin. So I'm only going to keep Binyamin as a slave, as an Eved, and you all go home to your father and take care of him. So then the brother says, oh, Binyamin's the one that's going to be the recipient of all of this? He wasn't even by the Mechira. He had nothing to do with Mechira's Yosef. So we see that it has nothing to do with the fact that we sell, sold our brother. And that's why they shifted gears suddenly and they went into a very fierce, combative motion against Yosef. Now, obviously, that 
redesigned the whole atmosphere. And the Pusik says as soon as they had their discussion, and we know that from Zos Hanukkah it goes into a Bechina of Golos, as we are, as I have said to you a few times, that this was the meeting of Yehuda and Yosef, Mashiach ben David and Mashiach ben Yosef. Now many held and are of the opinion, Sadiqim, that Mashiach ben Yosef came already. Some say it was Reb Shloima of Karlin, because it says that Mashiach ben Yosef will be killed, and he was killed by a Cossack's bullet that was shot, that he was shot, and he remained in a coma for three days. This happened in 1812. Uh, some say it was the Baal Shem Tov, that he was Mashiach ben Yosef. But everyone agrees that Mashiach ben David did not come, and that when he will come, that will bring about the total redemption and the era of bliss for Klal Yisrael, no more persecution, no more, no more expulsions, no more being blamed innocently like what we're living through right in the world now. Why, do the peop why are the people, like the Evan Ezra was in Spain, he brought it to its height. He brought it to a point that they were becoming the richest country in the world through his mastery of the treasury. And yet they went, Ferdinand and Isabella, and even though they said to him, to the Ibn Ezra, that you have nothing to do with this decree that either you have to convert or you have to leave Spain, and he didn't take it. He left that day with 75,000 people. He left Spain. But the point being that the beginning of the process of Geula with Mashiach ben David began with the confrontation of Yosef and Yehuda. And that brought out, even though it shifted gears, and now Yehuda became very tough with Yosef, the Pusik says immediately right after, Velo Yochol Yosef Lehisapek, he couldn't hold himself back, that he wanted to burst out crying. So the Meforshim interestingly point out that when a person is suddenly becomes full of emotion, they hear some uh, tremendous good news, or has to show them the opposite, and they break out and burst out into tears. You can't hold yourself back, but the answer is, and the Mephorshim say, you can. Because a person is in full control. Because the Pusik says that when he couldn't hold himself back from bursting out and crying, it said, he said to the Egyptians, Hotsiu Kola Anoshim may lie. Take everyone out, because he didn't want to embarrass his brothers, Behisvada Yosef El Echov. Because so on one hand, a person who can't, as the Pusik says, hold himself back. So he should start crying no matter what the situation. But Yosef was able, with not being able to hold himself back, to hold himself back, to have enough time to get everybody out, that when he had to admit to his brothers, Ani Yosef, that they would never come to an iota of embarrassment, the brothers, and therefore he superseded human koiches. If the Pusik is made velo yachol Yosef lehisapek, he couldn't hold himself back. But he did, because he took 10 words and he said, get the people out, I want everyone out of this room. And then he burst out 
into the thing you see that was like superhuman and how far we have to go with our koichas not to embarrass and not to put a person into a position of, of guilt, of discomfort, to be discourteous with a word this way or that way, we have to supersede the situation. A person is in a room with 20 people and he has an opportunity to say something funny that everyone's going to burst into laughter, but it's at the expense of somebody in the room. And he, he's dying to say it because he knows he's going to bring down with the laughter everybody there, but he doesn't do it because he has to supersede that thirst and that desire to come out and say what he would like to say. Now, we know that there's a famous question, why didn't Yosef simply send to his father a message that he was alive. So the Marsha discusses it by Arichas, that when the Shiv Tekor, the nine brothers, sold Yosef, they made a Shavua that they were not going to reveal it to anybody. And they didn't have a minion. So it says that they took HaKadosh Baruch Hu as the tenth. And even HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and at the end, when the Yasser Aruge Malchus came, and every one of the Shvotim went into a different Tana, who was killed as a Kapara from Mechiras Yosef, because there was a Chi of Misa, the Rabbi Akiva was Minish Masgerim, that he was Keneged HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu Kaviyochol, needed a kapara also. But no one was allowed, and even Yitzchak Avinu, who was the father of Yaakov, knew through his Ruach HaKodesh that Yosef was alive and well. And he didn't say, he saw his son sitting for 22 years crying in sackcloth and lost his Ruach HaKodesh because Ruach HaKodesh does not rest on anyone if he's not besimcha. And while he was crying and he was in his Avelos for Yosef, that he was not with his Ruach HaKodesh, but still Yitzchak Avinu knew that there was a Shavua and they were not allowed to reveal it till the actual second of when it had to be revealed. And that's why nobody, even Yosef, who knew where his father was, and obviously the brothers came down for food. It wasn't such a far distance. He could have sent one of the people to tell him, but he knew that there was a Shavuah, that he understood it, and therefore he says to Marsha, could not send anyone to notify his father that he was still alive. Now we know that Adam Arishon was over on Gimel, the Gimel Chamuros, that when there was only he himself and HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the world, when he listened to the Nachash, the Sforim, say that that was a Bechina of Avodah Zorah. Because when you're alone with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and you have a Tzalem Elohim, and you're big enough to know that there's no other force and power in the world other than HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and a Nachash comes and tells you to do something against what HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, so that's a Bechina of Avodah Zorah. And the, the Misa that he brought, in other words, was like a Bechina of Shvichas Domim, 
Because once he did that and he had to leave Gan Eden and everything, it was, he brought death to the world. No one was supposed to ever get sick get, or to die or any. And now people were going to die. That was a Bechina of Shvichas Domim. And it says, as the Arizal discusses, that Adam Arishon for 130 years was an Oiver Aved Avodazara with masculine Averis. For 130 years. And that's why it says in Medrash that he went into the Yama Melech that the salt should eat at his skin after those 130 years, for 130 years to do tshuva for that Averis which fell under the umbrella of Gilu Yaroyos. So the Arizal explains that that's why Avram Avinu, because Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov were all, all three worked to be Misaken the Avera of Adam Harishon. Avram Avinu took on the Avodah Zorah aspect and he was busy chopping up Avodah Zorah, fighting with his father Nimrod. Amra fell through him into the Kivshan Aish if he wouldn't be Oivet Avodah Zorah. So he was Mesakin for Adam Harishon, that Chet of Avodah Zorah. Yitzchak Avinu Shvichas Domim because he would put himself on the Arcade to be killed, to give his life for the Shvichas Domim that Adam brought to the world. And for the Gilu Yaroyos, Yaakov Avinu, it says, that he lived 147 years. 130 of those years were before he came to Mitzrayim, because it says, Vayechi Yaakov Beretz Mitzrayim Shva Esrei Shana, that he lived 17 years in Mitzrayim, and then he was Nifter. But before that, he lived 130 years, which was Keneged, the Avera of the Gilu Yaroyos of Adam Harishon. Those 130 years, that's why he suffered so, so much. Uh, that he lived only 147 years. We're going to talk why in just a moment because of the end of our parsha. But the 130 years that he lived with the Tsaras of Dina, the Tsaras of Love, and the Tsaras of Asav, that was Machaper, those 130 years, and the 130 years of Adam Harishon. So there was an unbelievable effort to bring about the kapara and the slicha and the mechila for Adam Harishon, which shows that the avos did not only project maisa avos simen lebonim, that future yidden would have the midos and the strengths of the avos that every word that they said and every machshava that they had and every maisa, everything they actually did was with a kavana of asidus that it should affect Klal Yisrael, their grandchildren and great-grandchildren and everything, but it was for the Ovar, for the past. And we too sometimes have to keep in mind that when we have fast days, we are misakin for that fast day, like this Friday, is Asura Bateves. Now we know that there's only two fast days that you would fast on Shabbos. It's Yom Kippur and Asura Bateves. Because Tisha B'av, if it falls out Shabbos, we fast on Sunday. It's a nitcha. But Asura Bateves, if it would, it can't come out Shabbos. But if it would, we would fast Shabbos because it says the word Be'etzem. By Yom Kippur 
and Yom Kippur, we fast Shabbos because of that word Be'etzem Hayom Hazeh. And by Asara Beteves, the same thing. And that's why, for instance, this, come, this year, Perm is Sunday. When do we fast uh, uh, Tanis Esther? We fast the preceding Thursday, not Friday, because you're not supposed to fast Erev Shabbos. Erev Shabbos is a Erev Shabbos. We don't fast on Shabbos except for Tanis Chalom and Yom Kippur. But Asar Beteves, because it falls out on Friday, we fast because it says as the Be'etzim. And how do we break the fast? With Kiddush. We have the fast. And it's probably the easiest fast of all. The, this year you can eat till 6.01 uh, before the fast Friday morning. And already 5.30, 6 o'clock, uh, in that Zman, you can already eat. So... Asar Bateves has that distinction and its uniqueness, just like Yom Kippur and fasting in the actual day. But the point being is that we are fasting because of the day of whatever happened on that day that we should be able to wipe out any remnant of something that caused that sorrow to happen on the day and we are 2,000 years later still fasting on that day to bring about a completion in its totality of whatever the Pagam was that brought about the tsara on that day. Now Yaakov Avinu, we know from the end of our Sedra that the end of our Sedra that, and that's why he lost 33 years of his life. He, he was supposed to live 180 years just like his father Yitzchak. And Avram Avinu, who lost five years so that he shouldn't see how bad Esav was, Yitzhak Avinu was the only one of the three who lived actually the 180 years. But Yaakov Avinu lived 147 because at the end of our Parsha, he came in to Paro and Paro asked him the first question, how old are you? Uh, we know that if we came into someone's house and we said, Sholem Aleichem, and the host says, uh, how old are you? Many people would be taken back, you know. Uh, I myself wouldn't care. I would say the thing, but many people would cringe at such a question. They're not comfortable talking about how old they are or whatever. And that was the first thing that, ya that Paro asked Yaakov Avinu. So for every word at that point in the Parsha, Yaakov Avinu lost a year of his life. So says the Gemara. He lost a year of his life. So Rav Chaim Shmuel Levit, Zechot Tzadik Levrocha, the mirror Rosh Yeshiva, asked if you look at the Parsha, it has 27 words about Yaakov Avinu complaining, yeah, many of my days were not so good. And, uh, and the reason that he asked this question is because Yaakov Avinu looked exceedingly old, the Medrash says. He looked so much older than his age that Paro couldn't hold himself back. He asked him, how old are you? Like, why do you look so wretched and, and, and old? In your, in your lifetime. So he answered Yaakov Avinu that, that because many of my days were, were not good, enough. and that was a criticism to Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov Avinu, who was the biggest of the Avos, the Bechir Sheba Avos, Avram and Yitzhak could not have the Shiv Teka. They couldn't have. 
because each one had a Russia for his son. But Yaakov Avinu, whose sons were Kulam Tzadikim Gemurim, he had the Shivtei Ka. He, he was the Bechir Sheba Avos, as the Gemara says, and the Medrash talks about. So, for him to say not good, I mean, a Yid is supposed to be dancing his whole life. Like when the Mizritcha Magid, a Yid came to him and said to him, Rebbe, like, how am I supposed to get through tough times and have full emuna and simcha? So he said to him, I want you to go visit one of my Hasidim and you can learn from him how to be besimcha even in tough times. So he sent him to Reb Zusha Meyanapol, who was the famous brother of the Noyam Elimelech, the Rebbe Reb Meilech. And he came, this chosid came to Reb Zusha and he said, uh, what's my eitz? So he said, why are you asking me? He said, well, the Mizri Chermagid, your Rebbe and my Rebbe, uh, sent me to you to learn how to be besimcha even in Tzoros. So Reb Zusha says, I don't know why the Rebbe sent you to me. And Reb Zusha had a unbelievable level of poverty and suffering. And Reb Zusha said, I never had a bad day in my life. Why would he send to me? I, I don't know what it means to be Tzoros and tell you how you can still be besimcha. I'm always besimcha. Uh, and these tzaddikim did not have to be poor. As we find by Rav Shimon Bar Yochoi, the Gemara says that there was a Talmud by Rav Shimon Bar Yochoi that he at one point decided to leave Rav Shimon Bar Yochoi's Beis Medrash, and he went out to business, to do business. And he became very, very rich. So he came back to the base of Medrash to visit his chaverim, the other Tanoyim. And they saw him pull up in his Rolls Royce, in other words, a golden wagon. And, a, and Rav Shem Bar Yochoi saw that they, he, the Talmud and his chaverim were looking at him like with a little bit of jealousy, a little bit of thirst. So Rav Shem Bar Yochoi said, I want everyone in the Beis Medrash to come out with me to the field. And Rav Shem Bar Yochoi said, Bika, Bika, field, I want you to give gold forth. And suddenly the entire field had stacks of gold, bars or coins or whatever was there, billions, trillions. And Reb Shem Bar Yechoi said to the Talmidim, to his Talmidim, anyone who wants can go take. I see you're so jealous of your friend who became so rich. Go take whatever you want. But one thing you have to remember, who takes over here is not going to take over there. In Shemayim, he's going to pay the price of the Ruchnias that he's going to lose and no one took. And they went back to the base of Medrash. So Tzaddikim had that power. As we see even today, someone who's a Tzaddik Gomer can give a bracha for Ashiras. Uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, he said well, one time by a Fabrengen, anyone here who wants to become rich should stand up. And only three people stood up. I, I knew all three. Uh, one of them is still living. And they were Aniyim, <laughs> real Aniyim, and they became fabulously one is a billionaire the one that's still living and the other two had at least 500 million dollars before they died so tzaddikim have you don't have to be Reb Shimon Bar Yochoi tzaddik gomer can be the bechina of Yosef tzaddik who hamashbir to give out parnosa but the tanai is kedusha and tahara 
And if the tzaddik, he can't be a tzaddik gomer without that level of kedusha and tahara. And and they could do it, but Reb Zushi and all these tzaddikim who suffered because they knew that they had a certain mission in life, and to get to that mission, they had to be makabal aniyas or sickness or other things which they had, but they didn't have to go through it if they didn't want, because they had the power in their hand to be a, like this Reb Zushia, uh, there was once somebody who came to him and said that he was, he had a dream, his father had just died, and his father um, came to him and told him in the dream to shmad, to convert. So he woke up and thought, what a crazy dream. My father just died. We finished the shiva just last week. And he's coming to me that I should shmad? So he ignored it. And then he came back the next day when he went to sleep and had the same dream. So after the third time, he went to Reb Zusha and he told him the dream that he had. So Reb Zusha said to him, that's a simon that when they buried him, that there's a cross, a crucifix, that's in the kever with him. So you have to go take him out of the kever, find it, and then rebury him. So, and they did that. They found that somebody, obviously one of, maybe one of the goyim who helped uh, with the burial, it fell in. So the Vilna Gon heard the story. He lived at the exact same time as Reb Zusha. And he was wondering, because Reb Zusha, he knew was a tzaddik gomer, but he was not the biggest lamdan. And the, the Vilna Gon said that the Yerushalmi says this, but where did Reb Zusha come to Yerushalmi? So uh, they told Reb Zusha what the Vilna Gon said. And he said, he's right. I didn't learn it in the Yerushalmi but I saw it in Shemayim, the place where the Yerushalmi got it from, to write such a thing. So you see how big, unbelievable these tzaddikim were. They were like uh, Lamala. I mean, no Malach, no Sorif could come near them, could do uh, anything. So anyway, coming back uh, to this, that Yaakov Avinu lost 33 years of his life because even the question that Paro posed, he was punished for because he shouldn't have looked so ba'atzvah, so despondent. So therefore, those seven words of that Pasek were in addition to how he answered with disappointment of how difficult he found life to be in many instances. So he paid a price with 33 years of life, which basically tells us that when we wake up in the morning and we wash Negelwasser by the bed, because in Parshish Mekates, just last week, the Zohar Kodesh says that if somebody stands up without washing Negelwasser first, then he can't have any Hatzlocha that day because he got up with the Ruach HaTumah on him, and he's walking, even though lahalocha, you're allowed to go into the bathroom, the house is Dalad Amis, you're allowed to do it. But we're speaking al Pikabola that the Ruach HaTumah stays, so that's why people wash Negel Vasa right next to their bed, that they won't put their feet down onto the ground without the Negel Vasa. So, so Yaakov Avinu, we have to appreciate, we get out of bed and we have a healthy day and we're able to work, we're able to learn a blot gemara, we're able to learn uh, Hasidish Sefer, we're able to learn the uh, Bimaver Sedra, we're able to do all the things that we do. So we only sometimes weigh in on 
the one or two problems that we have in life, that we're busy focused on that and not being besimcha and dancing, that we have another day of life and that we should be besimcha and enveloped and encompassed within an atmosphere of total simcha each and every day of our lives. Now, Yosef sent Agolos when he said to his brothers first, Ani Yosef, I am Yosef, so the Pasuk says, the brothers stood there, they were speechless. They couldn't say anything. That they were so overwhelmed that this is Yosef. So the Gemara says, uh, the Medrash says that he gave them terrible, tremendous tochacha. He rebuked them. So Rav Pam, Zechron of the asked, where do we find one word of tochacha? We don't see that. So the answer, he said, is the Ani Yosef. Just saying and making available all of the reasons of what happened. His brothers, they were angry at him. They went and sat as a Besden to kill him. And everybody, he's high of Misa, and he's in a, He wasn't, when he said a dream that Achad Osar Kochavim Mishtachavim Li, there was a pers- purpose, I'm feeding the entire world, that this didn't just happen wantonly and 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 derech agav, that there was good reason for what he was saying, and that you see it came out and actually happened. Now, the words on the Yosef are the greatest type of tochach a person could have, because sometimes someone does something, a father does something for good reason, and the child is very disappointed or angry, or the teacher in a classroom does something that they don't like. Then at the end of the story, they suddenly discover the good that came out because of what he did. That we have to evaluate in our lives that we are not in the driver's seat like the driver who slammed on the brakes and caused people on the bus who had a cup of coffee in their hand to become drenched with the coffee. Uh, and, and, and everyone else in the thing, one banged his head in the seat, and they were all angry at the driver. And then they found out that a baby ran out into the street and that the driver didn't hit or kill even the baby because he put his foot on the brake and had to immediately stop in a moment. So when they found out the reason, oh, the hot coffee didn't feel so hot because they understood that if had they been the driver, they would have also done the same thing. By saying Ani Yosef, it put the perspective of everything that happened. And that the Medrash says is what's going to be by the Geula Shlema. People had questions, why did a two-year-old child die? Why was an eight-year-old boy running across the street and a car hit him and killed him? What did he do? He was an innocent youngster. But when the curtain opens and you see what's going on backstage with the Ani Yosef of the time of Geula, that that eight-year-old boy had an neshama of a tzaddik gomer, and he didn't want to come down to Olam Hazeh. And the only reason he came was because there was a gezerah against a kahila that was going to be killed out. And because this neshama came down 
to do whatever he had to do here in this world. It saved an entire city. And after that happened that the city was saved. He didn't want to stay in Olam Hazeh with all the Nisyoinus anymore. And he went back up. As the Baal Shem Tev in many cases told people who lost children what the story was behind that neshama and why they wanted to leave at that point and they wanted to go back to Gan Eden Ha'elyon. So the perspective of Ani Yosef carries a dimension very, very far. Now, we know from the Parsha that when Yaakov Avinu came down, the Svasemis discusses it, when he came down, the first time, the minute that he saw Yosef, they, they embraced each other, they hugged each other, and, and Yaakov did not kiss or say anything to Yosef. So Rashi brings the Chazal that he was saying Krishna. So the Mephorshim asks, and the Sfas Emes discusses it, I mean, after you waited for 22 years and you thought he was dead, at that minute you couldn't take five minutes to kiss him and hug him and, and cry. and uh, Just Yosef was, but not Yaakov. So says the Sfas Emes, because the love that was a mountain of emotion at that minute, seeing Yosef, Yaakov Avinu, seeing him, he wanted to take and give over to our Kodesh Baruch Hu. So he said, Shema Yisrael and Krishna at that minute, those five minutes, and then he kissed him and, and did whatever he did with all of that emotion. But the first thing was he wanted to, on a silver platter, give to our Kodesh Baruch Hu that love that was built up for all of the years that he didn't see him. And now this second, and we should be able in our lives, when we have moments of simcha, and we have moments of success, to be able not to be foolish and stop, it only is happening because of our Kodesh Baruch Hu. Everyone knows that in their class they had people, boys, that they were with. Some remained on Niyam their whole life. Some became Gevir Madirim, and those who became Gevir many times were boys you never thought would succeed. They were not top students. They didn't know the best in the Gemara. But it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with Mazel. It has to do with Hashkocha. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted the person to succeed in life. That's exactly what ended up happening. So in our moments of success, we have to stop for a moment. Let's not kid ourselves. The guy who opened a business and thinks that his Chochmah and his strategy did, his, did the success is foolish. He knows that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in a moment of truth was the one that caused because there are other people smarter than him that went bankrupt. So we have to condition ourselves in the good moments. And the moment when we open up our eyes we say Moda'ani because we want to acknowledge HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that he gave back our neshama to us for another day of life. Now, when Yaakov Avinu was told that Yosef is still alive, so it says, Vatachi Ruach Yaakov Avihem, that the Ruach HaKodesh came back. And we know that the Medrash says that Serach Bas Osher, she knew how to play, some say it was a harp, some say it was a violin, but she was playing music to cushion the blow of the shock that Yaak and while she was playing the music, she was singing, Oid Yosef Chai, Oid Yosef Chai, Oid ya, that Yaakov Avinu would hear this, and Yaakov Avinu gave her a bracha 
that she lived for over 900 years. In those days, no one lived like that. They lived like we live, 80 years, 90 years, 100 years. And she lived for over 800 years. And we know that when Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to leave Mitzrayim, and he came uh, to B'nai Yisrael and said, it's time for Kla Yisrael to leave. And they said, but there was supposed to be a password. And the Medrash says the words that were said to Moshe Rapokod Yifkod Elokim Eschem was the password. But nobody in Mitzrayim knew the password. So the Medrash says that they went to Serach Bas Osher, who was still living. And from the time of Yaakov Avinu to, Mo to Moshe Rabbeinu, was like <coughs> 300 years, uh, and Sarah was alive and well, and they went to ask her. They went and they said that he's saying, Pokod Yifkod, is that the password? And she said, absolutely, and that means it's time to leave Mitzrayim. And when they were leaving and they had promised Yosef at Sadiq they would take out his Aron, his body, his bones, from Mitzrayim back to Eretz Yisrael. So they didn't know Moshe Rabbeinu. Everyone was busy collecting the gold and silver. So the Medrash says, but Moshe Rabbeinu was busy looking for the Aaron of Yosef till he went over to Serach Basotra and says, do you know where he was buried? I'm supposed to t we're supposed to take him out. And she said he was put into the Nile into the river and he's at the bottom of the river and throw in a paper with the words Ali Shor that he was called Bechor Shor Hador Lo he had the strength of an ox in fighting off the Yetzirah with with Asha's Potiphar he was called a Shor an ox and he Moshe Rabbeinu threw in the the words Ali Shor and up came the Oren to the top of the water and they took out the Oren as promised and we even find by Dovra Melech which was 700 years later from the time of when she was with Yaakov Avinu that there was a Murid B'Malchus that uh, Sheva ben Bichri and he was supposed to be put to death, a murdered b'malchus, and he ran into a walled city, the, the Tanakh says, and he, he was in there in the walled city, so when the army of David came, and they wanted to grab him and kill him, so they couldn't get into the city. So they sent a message into the city, either you send him out, or we're going to attack and kill the city. So they didn't know what the halacha was. Are they allowed to, to give out a man that they knew was going to be killed? So the Medrash says that they went, the Pasuk says they came to an Isha Zakena to ask her the Shaila, and she paskin, he's a murdered by Malchus, you have to send him out. And Rashi says, Zu Serach Bas Osher. So she was the one that Yaakov Avinu had given the brach of Arichas Yomim. And why did Yaakov Avinu suddenly believe them? That he was alive. So it says in Pasik, Vayaris Ha'agolos, he saw the wagons. Now, the Gemara explains that the word agola, wagon, is spelled exactly the same way as the word egla. And the last thing that Yaakov Avinu was learning with Yosef HaTzadik before he ended sending him out to find the brothers and being sold was the Parsha of Egla Rufa, which is when a dead body is found in between two cities, and velo noda mihi kahun, they don't know who killed him. So the whole world stopped. 
It's not like today that there's eight more people today killed in New York and uh, tomorrow 12 people. Like another life, another life that it becomes cheap. They stopped the Sanhedrin in Yerushalayim and they made the, the whole Sanhedrin come to where they found the dead body to do the measuring between the two cities to know which one, which city was the dead body that they found closer to. This was a world event, the fact that there was a dead body found. And they were learning, Yaakov Avinu and Yosef, about this Parsha. So when he saw the wagons, which is Agola, and he remembered the Parsha of Egla, so Egla and Agola. Now really that's a little far-fetched, just because he saw that this, the, uh, the, the wagons and... And the fact that the word Egla is the similar, is the same letters, so that reminded him that, and that's how he believed. But the Mephoshim say an interesting note, and that is that a person could go through life cherishing something. For instance, someone has a bracelet and somebody came and put down the glass near the bracelet and by mistake it hit the bracelet and the diamond fell out. So it took her a week to have the bracelet fixed and repaired and the diamond put back in. When a person ends their life, it's zero. The bracelet doesn't mean a thing, the diamond doesn't mean a thing. All these things that we worked so hard, oh, to refurbish the house. Yeah. Now, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with a person refurbishing their house, and they should, to be able to live with that harchava as Yidin deserve. But when we turn it into a golden life, that is a the day we're nifter, it becomes nothing, not even the dust of the earth, the houses, the bracelets, the, the, it's zero. What is the thing that we carry with us? Obviously, the Torah, the mitzvahs, the meisim toivim, the chesed, the five dollar bill that you handed to the oni that after being a day without eating that he could go in and buy a sandwich and a coffee, and, and, and take away that hunger. That's what the person takes with him. Ruchnius can be the only thing that heals a problem in Olam Hazeh and in Olam Abba. As a matter of fact, in the time of the Vilna Gon, there was a Chosen Kala, and the day after the Chasna, the Chosen disappeared. And Nebuch, the scholar, became an Aguna. Aguna means chained. Because she has no get, so she can't remarry. And she doesn't have a husband. So she remains in a state of Aguna. Thirty years later, a knock at the front door, the Aguna opens the door, and a man walks in and says, I am back. He's back, the husband. Now, 30 years later, he looked much older. I mean, 30 years is 30 years. I once had a black beard too. You know, we become gray, we become white. We got... So, and he starts to prove that he's the husband. Do you remember the chasna? He went from the color of the tablecloths to the everything even intimate things that only a husband would know. But they didn't know what to do. It's a suffocatious ish. I mean, we're not playing around over it. This is the most serious thing. So they went to the Vilna Gon, and the Vilna Gon told them, take him into the shul and ask him 
to point where his makam kavua, his seat was, where he davened each and every day. And they took him in and he couldn't answer and they saw that he was lying. So they came back to the Vilna Go and they said that the Rebbe, Prophet Moifus, that we didn't know to believe him. Not, he said it was no Moifus. That all the things that he was saying about the tablecloths and about the, even the intimacy and everything, that was Gashmias. You can't reconnect and be matra ashes ish without some dover ruchni. So when it came to ask him where he sat and where he davened and where he learned and he couldn't show, that was the answer. It was very simple. So said the Vilna Gon. So we have the moments in life to attach ourselves, and that's why it says that when somebody parts with his friend, he should part with a dvar halacha. Now, the man's leaving, so is that the minute to take, is that the time to take two minutes and say a dvar halacha? But the reason for it, explained the Vilna Gon, is because the person wants to maintain the love and the friendship with the Chavar. And he's, the, the halacha is giving you the segula, how to maintain, not just to say goodbye or to give him a cake and that he should have uh, what to enjoy on the way out, which there's nothing wrong with that. But if you want to, to part from a friend and maintain and hold on to the friendship. You have to do it in a way that the cementing factor is ruchnius, because then you can hold on to that closeness and to the memories of everything that that friendship represents. Now, when and the Maral talks about why did he send ten donkeys with him? And the Maral says, and the Ger Rebbe, the Beis Yisrael, explained more why it was donkeys, because the animal that has the least seichel is a donkey. A donkey, you put a load on its shoulder and it walks and it carries it. That's the extent of its seichel. That he wanted through the donkeys, and why it was ten donkeys, says the morale, was because ten was for the shift, take a message to them that each and every one of you are like a donkey. You don't understand the, the super picture of the world and why things have to happen. You're just like puppets with the puppeteer, that the puppeteer is playing with the, with the actual puppet. That you were the vehicle to save the world from hunger. And you were able to bring about the gladness of heart and the ability of people to survive was because of what you did. So don't get into a discussion. Like he said, al Don't dally, don't talk around and start pointing at each other. Oh, you see, had you told us to do this and that, all of us, your brother, would have listened to you. Or you, who did this and that, that you shouldn't have. Don't start the blame thing, because you were just like puppets. Like the 10 donkeys that we're sending. Why not 12 donkeys? That's a Maral's Kasha. That why not 12 donkeys? Why not 15 donkeys? Because he wanted to say that every one of you are just like a donkey. That with all the seichel and all the tzidkas, that you can only have a limited view in olam hazeh of what's doing, and you're just like a donkey with a mission that you have to carry out. Now, The, 
the Gemara says that when he said, Al Tir Gezubadarach, and I'm completing this share in just a minute, that one of the things he said, Al Tafsiu Psia Gasa, do not go at a faster pace. In other words, when a person has to get to a certain destination, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gets him there exactly when he has to be there. And it's like a person gets on Rosh Hashanah how much money he's going to make. And if he is destined to make that year $150,000, but he had a break-in in his car, and he thinks, oh, you know what? I can tie it that I had my silver stolen, so I'll get another $8,000 in insurance. So doing something like that, he's not going to. He'll end up investing in the stock market. He'll lose the 8000 Because if on Rosh Hashanah he was destined to have the 150000 you didn't have to do, do a Dvar Aveira with your chachma thinking you're going to end up with extra money. There's no such thing as extra money. The only time that a person could get extra money from, a machsh, from what was destined on Rosh Hashanah, say Sfarim, is the Seder by night. That if he does the mitzvahs with Termender, because Pesach is that we're nidoiden ala tfuah, the Mishnah says we're judge how much food, which means parnasa in the world, and it's bepesach, and with the mitzvahs halayla of the seder, that if he does it with such simcha and such hinder, that he could end up with whatever he was destined Russia ending up with more. That that could break it. But people make cheshboinus, and that's what the Kotzker said, the Kotzker Rebbe says this word, that when, Yaakov, when Yosef said to them, don't rush home to get to Yaakov, the second he's supposed to find out that I'm alive is the second that you're going to get there. So don't rush. Al tirgizu badorech al tafsiu psia gasa. Have a wonderful week. And the Abshah Zahelfen, that the Shabbos should be with all of the Pichif kids, with the Oinig Shabbos, with the beautiful Dvar Torah at the table, and with all the beautiful Ma'cholim, Lekovit Shabbos, and Oinig Shabbos.